Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Greetings to each one of you in the precious name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we know, we're going through the series looking unto Jesus. And as we continue in this series, our our objective through this very long series by God's grace and his will is that we would pause a moment to look unto Jesus in a, with a fresh set of lens. Um, I know many of these things are very familiar to us, and, but the Spirit of God really, it's in the heart of the Spirit of God to speak to each, to each one of us in a fresh way because we go through life daily, right? We encounter things in our life that are fresh and, and the Lord also wants to walk beside us too to remind us afresh about his word and about ultimately about Christ himself. So as we turn to scripture, let us turn to John chapter 1, 43 to 51. John chapter 1, 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? you will see greater things than these. And he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us lift up our, the Bibles in our hands or just our hearts to the Lord and let us pray. Lord, we exalt you and we give you thanks for this morning, God, as we are here before this word, God, I pray that you would divide it for us, Lord. There are thoughts that you have given your servant. I pray only the thoughts that this congregation and the wider audience need to hear will only be heard. Pray that, you, uh, that I will be covered by your blood, uh, Lord God, and uh, hide under your cross, O oh Lord, for where I find redemption and the qualification just to even go to these verses. I praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we look through, and I'm going straight into the word, when we look through these verses from 43 to 51, we see friendship in action. I call it friendship evangelism. It's not my term by any means, but it is a common term. So when we look here, we see Philip, who is from Bethsaida, same town as Andrew and Peter, it says that Jesus found Philip, and, and Jesus says to him, follow me. Now, I, I don't want to go too much into Philip because there are certain instances that, that we will talk about in the future series about Philip regarding to miracles of Jesus and, and Jesus' uh, kind of these teachings on his, his, his crucifixion, the predictions. And so there's, a, there's some story there behind Peter, so I'm going to move past that and focus more on Nathaniel today morning. So when we look in these passages, Matt, Philip goes to, Philip first goes to his friend, Nathaniel. And we can see here what they, what they have in common. Here in verse 45 it says, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of of Joseph. Just imagine that these two individuals had in their hearts 
They start, they, to, to follow Christ or fa- fa- find this Messiah. These two had in their hearts to dig into Scripture and to talk through Scripture, to debate Scripture, to reason with Scripture. These two friends sincerely, sincerely sought the Messiah. And here Philip says, we have found him finally, of whom the Mo- of Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Now, many of your friendship circles might not have this level of depthness in, in maybe discussing the word. I understand that. I've ha- I have also many friendships that don't go into this deep level. But there are two things to think about here that in the, the, you, you can have multiple circles of friendship. One circle of friendship will have to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ. That there is no friendship like the friendship that in fellowship that you can have with those who are in the faith. And that is something to ask ourselves. Who are the people in our life? Who are the people in our life that are in the faith, that are in the battle with us, who understand Scripture like we do, who understand Christ like we do, who understand the situations in our life and see it in the eyes of grace and able to speak into our life the words of life into us. There's also friends in our circle that, you know, when we go in a school setting or a, 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 a work setting, or if you have any uh, you know, outside the school activities, whatever it may be, there are people in our life that really do like us as a person. They like our attitude. They, they, we have some common interests, common hobbies. There are, you know, they may like that you have a good work ethic, that you're honest in things, that you are sincere. And, and you know, maybe they even like your personality, the way that you make jokes. All that is part and parcel of who you are, and there are people in the world that they may not know Christ, but they are friends with you. And that is perfectly okay. And that is much encouraged because we like to say often to, to isolate ourselves from things, but we have a mission field. And the mission field are, is really the areas of our life where we are we are contributing to society, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the school, whether it's in other activities. We are out there in the world. We have to be. We cannot be held up in, in, in the four corners of a, a building or a house without being a light unto the world. We are not supposed to cover ourselves under a basket, right? So in this friendship circles, it is God places people in our life sovereignly and by his by his direction almost we don't pick sometimes the friends that God brings in our life the people that we are able to connect with in a level that maybe sometimes we're even counseling them and they're like man you have you have a lot of depth to you like where is this coming from and and there's there's this calmness in your soul that that perhaps those friends recognize there's this wisdom that, that that these friends recognize there's a kind of integrity that is core to you, that these friends recognize. And these friends are put in our life so that we may share the reason for the hope that is within us. That we have to take on that, that call of, of sharing Christ. If we can share everything else in our life with them. We might talk about things at home. We might talk about things at work. We need somebody to vent to at work, right? Right? You, you, you might talk about things in school. You might, may, might, might be studying together on an, an exam. These people with common interest are put in there by the Lord so that you can share what is most valuable to you. You can share who is most core to your life, and it is Jesus. And so Philip here is in the first category of having a friend that is walking with him. But just imagine here, Philip, the first thing that he can do is run to his friend, Nathaniel. And he knows exactly where Nathaniel is. He's under the fig tree. So Nathaniel is a person, he's also called Bartholomew or Bartolmai. That is uh, son of Tolmai is his other name. So if he has a full name, it will be Nathaniel Bartolmai. Okay. He, upon hearing this, he says, verse 46, and you see a, a, an aspect of his character and his personality here. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, when you think about Nazareth, and, and we see later on that Nathaniel is from Cana. 
John says it himself uh, towards the end of the Gospels. So Cana is a little bit north of Nazareth, and Cana is a little bit less significant than Nazareth. Nazareth is not all that great, but Cana is just a little bit even less significant than Nazareth. So there is a kind of a rival tendency here. And, and there is something deeper that we know about the word Nazareth as well. But there is this inferiority complex. There's this insecurity that sometimes that we have, even Nathaniel who is under the fig tree, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, as he's even under the fig tree and as Jesus says some great things about him, there's this prejudgment in his heart. And this is really very a distinct Malayali quality that each, each one of us struggle with, this prejudgment this, pre, this preconceived notion, this inferiority complex to, to put others down. Because there is something that is within us. There's something lacking within us. There's an insecurity within us. There's an emptiness within us. So we have to knock others down. And here Nathaniel is coming in with that prejudgment. He's saying, what good can come out of Nazareth? When we look at the word Nazareth and and in the past, John Morgis actually had a message on this, so I would encourage you to re-listen if you really want to learn. But this word Nazareth is very close to the word netzer or branch. And so, and you know, when you go to that message, I recommend you to go to that message because of lack of time. But what we see is this word is also seen in Isaiah 11.1. 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is a, this is a messianic pr- prophecy talking about Jesus coming from the lineage of David, from the lineage of Jesse. This branch is Jesus Christ. And, and in the Hebrew days, this word branch was a word saying, in, this is insignificant. In Malayalam, we, we use the word, uh, you know, if you translate grass, that is sort of a similar word in Malayalam. Like it's an insignificant thing. Branch. What good can come from this place called Branch? It's just an insignificant place. So, you know, one thing that's shown in my heart is this, that every time, like when we cast out demons in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, or when we say the Jesus of Nazareth, we are proclaiming the fact that Jesus from in, in, in an insignificant place, Jesus from an insignificant place, in that alone, we experience the humility of Christ, that the Jesus I proclaim, the Jesus that I, that the name of Jesus that I speak into to destroy the works of the enemy, is a Jesus of insignificance, yet the Lord of glory. This is the tension that we live in. Hallelujah. So Jesus, as we know, 33 and a half years, he went under the radar of a lot of people, especially people that ought to know that he was coming. They were blinded from seeing that the, 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 the Lord of glory was walking in their midst. The word of God made flesh. Pharisees battling against him, trying to test him. The leaders trying to plot ways to destroy him. All these people were blinded from seeing the Lord of glory. As believers, people may say to us, what good can come out of you? What good can come out of your family? What good can come out of your church? What good can come out of your marriage? I would say to you, Jesus can. Jesus can. Take that in the heart this morning. Many of us here are carrying wounds of years and years past where we are still struggling with this this feeling of worthlessness, of words that people have spoken to us, that judgment, prejudgment and judgment in general that people have over us because of mistakes that we may have made or missteps that we have made. And I'm speaking to you and saying that in that, Rejoice in knowing that I will, I'm able to participate in the sufferings of Christ. And in my, through that, through that despise, uh, through, that, through that words of condemnation, through the words of belittling, I'm able to say in my heart, 
Jesus can't come out of me. That I am the letter of Christ for this dying world. The Lord is writing a story with him at the center of it all. Him reigning. Saying, like, because Jesus. You can say, but Jesus. Whatever failures that we had, but Jesus came in my life. That is our testimony. Amen. Using insignificant, unwise losers like us. I'll use that word. And putting value in us. Adopting into his family. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus in verse 47 says this, Behold, he sees Nathanael coming to him and says, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. You know, although Nathanael made a prejudgment about Nazareth, he still heard his friends say, Come and see. You know, Nathanael could have said, could have said Stop joking with me. Like, this is, I'm not coming. But Nathaniel did. And so we have to credit that he trusted his friend to say, my friend here has something serious to say about this. I trust his judgment. I'm going to go see what he is talking about. So Nathaniel goes. And, and so Jesus, seeing him coming, says, Behold, an Israel indeed, in whom there is no deceit. In one way, we can see that there's a praise. Uh, there's a praise in here. Jesus won't just make up words, right? He won't lie, right? He won't say things to please people, right? That, we know that about Jesus. He calls him an Israelite, and he says there's no deceit. I mean, there's nobody else that I know of in, in Scripture. Maybe someone else can correct me, but where Jesus looked at them and said, in this person, there's no deceit. This is the highest words, even from the start of Jesus' ministry. And now when we look at ourselves, and this is where we struggle. Malayalis in particular, my Malayali brothers and sisters, we, st we are so, we have a shell of protection over us that we think somebody's about to fool us and cheat us. So we have to match their level of deceit with our level of deceit. So it's like a battle of deceitfulness. We, sh we hide knowledge, we hide information because we don't trust that that person is fully trustworthy. So we also match that deceitfulness with deceitfulness. And I'm telling you that, when look at it from the lens of Jesus. What judgment does Jesus make in that situation? One thing that, you know, that Malayalis like to say, or Malayalis like to hear, or maybe not like to hear, is the word, you know, Aveno Avala Pawan, you know. I mean, some people like to hear that. Some people don't like to hear that because that has a negative connotation. There's a good poem and a bad poem, you know. And, and so I remember one time, in, in, you know, my family in general likes to rank all the cousins, you know. In term, and I have a lot of trauma from that. But, you know, just uh, who is the best looking, who is the tallest, who is the smartest. And one, one of them was who was the most poem in the family. And in that... Uh, I won't say where I got ranked, but I was somewhere in the top. But, <laughs> but one, one family member said, I'm not going to power no la. Then I figured out this, this person knows me really well because that is true. So all of us might not be problem, but that doesn't give us the license to be deceitful. We can, we can be smart and clever and know things, but yet we should not harbor any deceit. Our mouths should not speak deceit. When you say something, it has to be the truth. We cannot deceive others. So I'm calling for some people here. You don't have to say anything. Just in your heart, say, Lord, just like Christ was said of Christ that there was no deceit in his mouth, help me to walk like Christ and make a decision this morning, Lord. I don't want to be a person of deceit before your eyes, Lord. I want to hear. And of course, we have made mistakes in our past. Of course, there have been instances in the past, but we can walk. Today could be the day where we put to death the words of deceit that we carry and say, Lord, I want to make a decision right now, Lord. That I want to put to death that, that tendency in me to say lies, to deceive people. 
to not be a person of integrity. And I pray, Lord, that you will give me the power in the Spirit, Lord. Cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. And I pray, Lord, that by the power, help me to say the truth, even when it's hard to say the truth. Help me to speak the truth in love. Help me to be truthful about myself. Help me to be an open book because I know, God, that I walk before you who knows everything. Verse 48. Nathaniel says, how do you know me? So there has to be something there in Nathaniel's life where he made some decisions that hurt him, perhaps. Be, not being deceitful, you can get hurt in this world. People can accuse you of being deceitful when you've been 100% honest. So maybe this is something that is core to his, in his prayers and as he's under the fig tree. And maybe that's, these are things that he's wrestling with and he's praying to God. Jesus confirms this and says, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel was in the secret place with God. And so fig tree is a common place for people to go. You know, the homes, we don't have, they don't have the large homes that we have with multiple bedrooms. It's usually just one big room with some corners. Many of us have grown up in those circumstances in, back home in India. So there's not a private place, so to speak, so people go out and go under trees and meditate and, and meditate over the scriptures, pray unto uh, Yahweh. And so here, Nathaniel perhaps was meditating on the Messianic prophecies, praying, Lord, when will I see you? When will I see the Messiah? When, who, who is the Messiah? And in that moment, Jesus, being omniscient, be Jesus who knows every human heart, saw Nathaniel praying in that moment. And so my encouragement to each one of us as we are in the secret place with the Lord, where no one else is watching. Unfortunately, we like to, we like to proclaim all these things. Our personal walk and seek, uh, our secret relationship with the Lord is all out in the media. And, I, and I, it's really unfortunate that we, have, we feel forced to say this because we want to get accl uh, acclamation. But the Lord truly recognizes those who have Put aside every, every notion of wanting to be public and, and, and want to come secretly before the Lord and, and say certain things to the Lord only between them and the Lord. And, and I'm, I promise you that whether it's here or whether it's in eternity, you will hear the confirmations of your deepest, deepest cries of your heart in the secret place. The Lord is hearing everything. The Lord is here. Even now as we are meditating His Word, the Lord is everywhere. There is nowhere that the Lord is not. He is hearing our hearts cry. He is hearing our deep deepest pains in our heart as we pray to the Lord in the secret, even things that we cannot share with other people, the deepest, deepest things in our heart, the Lord is hearing it, and he will confirm and said, when you were in that moment, in that time, I heard you. Hallelujah. My time is running out, so I'm going to say with this one thing, and the Lord's team can come forward. In verse 50, the, uh, Jesus says, because I said to you, you're under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. There are many people that have come to the faith because of a healing or because of a particular circumstance where you just could not deny that the Lord intervened in your life. All those things need to be... thankful. You have to be thankful about that. You have to meditate on that. You have to say, thank you, Lord, over and over. But... There are many more things that the Lord wants to show you. So Jesus might be asking some of us, because I healed you, do you believe? Because I gave you a job, do you believe? Because I answered your prayer, do you believe? Jesus is not transactional. He is genuinely helpful. And everybody's looking at the moon on the stage. Let us focus on the Lord. He wants to bring repentance so that we can see him. This is, the way of God is using the circumstances of our life to point us to him. Because he is our greatest reward, as, as a sister was saying yesterday, or a brother was saying yesterday in our prayer meeting. He is our greatest reward. Like, you get Jesus, and that is the biggest blessing of your life. You might be praying for certain things to happen in your life today, tomorrow, and the days to come. 
Because God may have answered your prayer in the past. You're like, God, you answered in the past. You have to answer this. You have to answer this. And the Lord is gently and quietly saying, but I've given you something greater than these things. I've given you myself. I've given you myself. And he says, First Timothy 1, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The way that I saw this is, you know, we talked about Peter, right? Peter, it was in the boat. Peter said, I, depart from me, I'm a sinner. You saw Matthew in the middle of stealing money from people through taxes. Jesus says, come out or follow me. And he leaves the booth and comes. But Nathaniel is in a different case. Nathaniel might be in the boat of, like many of us, growing up in the church, we, um, we might not be, uh, you know, the, we might not have a, a cool testimony. We might just be the normal kid that just obeyed their parents, did all the right things, and then you see somebody doing some crazy stuff coming to the Lord, and you're like, man, I, didn't, I don't have that crazy testimony. I might not be loved by God. But here's the, here's the thing, for encouraging, especially those second, third generation Christians Look at what Jesus is doing here. As Nathaniel was under the fig tree, meditating deep things from scriptures. As Nathaniel was praying. You think Nathaniel was praying one time? Or Nathaniel and Philip were discussing scripture one time? No, this was a habitual, this was a practice of their life to, to constantly engage with, the, with, with scripture and, and praying and seeking. And in that practice, where does Jesus, what did Jesus say? Even before a lot of others heard he, Nathaniel, hears a deeper truth about Jesus. That he will see the heavens open and the angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man. This reminds us of who? Jacob's dream. The Jacob's ladder. That should be very, very so fresh in Nathaniel's mind who is looking to the Old Testament. Jesus is saying that ladder that, that Jacob saw that, that started from the earth into the heaven, I am that ladder. So do you see that as you go deeper with Jesus, Jesus goes deeper with you. There is no end to the depths of God. So this is my encouragement to you. Do not stay stuck in the shallowness. Don't get stuck in the shallowness. Go deep with the Lord. Go deep with the Lord. Go and engage with the Lord. And He will be there. And He will show deeper truths. Because you know why? Because He knows that is your, that's going to be the greatest satisfaction. That's your greatest joy. Knowing Jesus more. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters. Knowing Jesus more is what's going to keep you away from sin. Knowing Jesus more is, is what's going to give you cl clarity in your direction of life. We are talking about surface level things. But Jesus ain't come in the depths with me. I will show you more deeper things. I will take you through perhaps situations that you didn't expect but I will speak to you and say I'm taking you through this so you may participate in the sufferings of Christ. I'm taking you through so you can understand what that meant for me. I want you to know this journey and this will make sense in eternity. Everything that you go through today will make sense in eternity. So I'm Jesus saying, I'm inviting you to come in the depths with me. Stop the shallow Christianity and come in the depths. Let us go deep with Jesus and he will meet you there. As deep as we can, the secret place. Let us go deep with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us worship the Lord. Let us stand and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.